distinguished guests, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here in Lebanon once more. I've been quite a frequent visitor to Lebanon in recent years. Uh, and I think I'm the only person here who is uh, associated with all three of the organizing institutions of this uh, uh, meeting, the Mohana Foundation, the Government Actuaries Department, and the Lebanese Actuarial Association. So it's great to be with you and um, to talk about social security and social security reform. As uh, Mr. Verstappen mentioned in his introductory remarks, social security has had some notable successes in improving social protection and social cohesion in society and in contributing uh, towards peace in our communities. It has done many things to help individuals face up to the contingencies of life and particularly to old age and incapacity and bereavement. And in this region it has also contributed to the generation of uh, investment funds since many of the social security funds, particularly in the Gulf area, are substantially uh, developed in terms of their investment activities. But there is a huge amount of discussion about social security about, around the world about whether it can continue in its present form and what the challenges are that are facing social security. Why is it so high on the agenda, for example, of the World Bank and other international organizations? So I want to look at some of the factors which are raising social security to the top of the agenda. Uh, to talk a bit about demographic transition, as our chairman uh, has already indicated, and then to discuss some of the transformations of social security systems which are taking place around the world and the challenges of that they uh, confront us with. Now, at the top of the list of factors which are affecting traditional social security schemes in many countries, is the demographic aging of the population. And although, as the chairman has said, the Arab world is in a slightly later phase of demographic transition than other countries, I think we'll see from some of the statistics in a few minutes uh, that the aging of the population is going to be a significant issue in this region as well as in other regions. But also factors which are very important in this are the fact that many social security schemes have been established in relatively recent years and therefore they are in a process of maturing, that is they're becoming more uh, active in terms of paying benefits rather than just uh, receiving contributions. The cost of the scheme is rising fast as more and more people uh, have full entitlement to benefit. Another major factor which is particularly relevant to some of the schemes uh, in this region is the low age at which many people are able to uh, take retirement and to become entitled to a pension. And with the very high ages for which people are now anticipating to survive, uh, this presents a high cost scenario for social security schemes if we allow or even encourage people to retire at young ages. Then there are other factors which have stimulated the debate, such as the growth of the economy, the need to uh, make capital markets develop, the issues of globalization, which the chairman just referred to, uh, the fact that in many social security schemes there are uh, poor incentive structures which don't encourage people to contribute in the way they should. They encourage people to take a shortcut to get the best benefits possible. Um, and that has led to considerable financial difficulties in some schemes uh, and led to an urgent need uh, for reform. Another significant factor which is high on the agenda of the, uh, the ISSA and the International Labour Organization at the moment, and that is the issue of coverage. The, I, the aim should be that Social Security should cover uh, the whole population, not just a small sector of the population. And then, of course, there are political 
changes which have led to different attitudes towards social protection and the different responsibilities of individuals, state and employers. What do we mean by demographic aging? We mean a combination of lower fertility, that is to say fewer births uh, per uh, woman in society, uh, together with increasing tendency for people to live from increased expectation of life. There are other factors, uh, particularly relevant in some countries, the bulge of uh, births at certain times in the past leading to the so-called baby boom, boomers in some countries, a high number of people of a particular age group moving through the system. But one way or another, the overall impact is that over time, there will be a reduction in the number of people of working age to support those of um, retirement age as the population becomes more heavily weighted towards those older ages. And there may be changes within the structure as well, more older workers and fewer younger workers compared to what we have known previously. And certainly, a very much larger number of elderly people, and particularly very elderly people, uh, where in the past very few people reached the age of 80, in the future we can expect quite a high proportion of people to reach that sort of age. Now, of course, we need to look at the demographic characteristics of each country individually, and we don't have time to do that today. That's something which uh, is done in the context of the actuarial reviews of social security schemes. They have to focus on the specifics of each country, and today I'm really just going to give some generalizations uh, which may indicate the, the line of uh, the way in which this is developing. Now, fertility rates have been falling in, in most uh, parts of the world. I mean, the biggest fall in fertility rates took place first in the OECD industrialized countries, and this graph shows uh, a lot of those countries, but it shows also that converging towards the, the position of those uh, more mature demographic countries, uh, we can also see China and India and Russia all heading down towards a, a roughly similar position of uh, fertility rates implying less than replacement of the existing population, fewer than two children uh, per woman. And if we look at the, the specifics of the, the region, um, frankly the yellow line which is North Africa is not particularly clear, but you can see the, um, the blue line there which is Western Asia which covers countries uh, to the south and east of here within the Arab world. Uh, the yellow line for Northern Africa covers the, the countries uh, across, uh, Africa, across the north of Africa uh, to the, the west of here. And the um, purple line for comparison is Southern Europe, uh, Greece, Italy, Spain. And you can see that the European picture is, is lower, but the, the trend is to convergence. And there is a substantial reduction taking place across the whole region in the, the level of, of births. Per Similarly, at the opposite end of the life uh, spectrum, expectation of life remains somewhat lower in the region than in uh, Europe, but is rapidly converging towards a similar level. So by uh, 2010, we can expect a considerable uh, additional degree of convergence. Same for females, although relatively higher, they can see projection that for Western Asia, female expectation of life will be about 75 in the year 2010, compared to about 82 in Europe. But it's still lower, but it's getting much closer. It's closer in some countries than others. So what does this imply? Well, it implies something like what is shown in this graph here, which is based on UK statistics, but it's designed to show that this increase in the expectation of life is mostly made up of two elements. Firstly, the reduction, very substantial reduction in infant mortality. You can see the red line there, which is a, a picture from nearly 100 years ago, which shows that in the early years of life, right to the left-hand side of the graph, there was a big drop, and that's still the case in many countries today. But it's becoming less and less a factor. More and more children survive um, the early years of life. 
Second factor is that people are not dying before the age of retirement to any significant extent. A hundred years ago, there was a su substantial uh, drifting away of the, the numbers in the population uh, before the age of 60. In fact, that red line you can see, only about 50% of people uh, survive to the age of 60. Whereas now, 50% of people survive to the age of 80 in the UK. Uh, so it's what has been known as the rectangularization of the mortality curve. It's more or less a rectangle. It goes straight across and then it comes down. That means that the vast majority of people will survive through working life to retirement and will start to receive a pension. And a significant proportion of people will receive that pension uh, at least up to the age of 80 and many uh, to ages beyond that. So it's an important factor in planning both for pension uh, schemes and for healthcare systems. And this is the other side of the coin. This shows when people die and it shows that the weight of the number of people dying has been gradually shifting across to the older ages. So you can see the peak of that curve of deaths is shifting across to the right so that uh, by uh, the time we come to the generation that was uh, born in 1960, which is the latest generation shown on this graph, who are now just over 40 years old, they can expect that the, uh, the main preponderance of people from that generation will die around the age of 85. So that's the, the extent to which uh, the expectation of life is pushing out the boundaries of what we need to plan for in pensions and social security systems. If we look at it in terms of dependency ratios, then we can see uh, that, without exception, all countries uh, shown here, and in fact, pretty well all countries around the world, are going to experience this gradual uh, upwards push in the dependency ratio, the ratio of the number of people over 65 to the number of people deemed here to be of working age, 15 to 64. Now, of course, you can do this more accurately taking into account the exact retirement age in each country and the pattern of retirement, but the basic picture will still be the same because of this uh, inexorable uh, aging of the population, that this ratio or equivalent ratios will be heading steadily upwards. And uh, this one shows that the picture for Western Asia and Northern Africa is not nearly as intense as what happens in Europe, but it will come and it will come in later years more than in the immediate future. That shows the extent of the upward push from a lower level uh, in the Arab world than in, in Europe, but still the change over the next uh, 10, 20, 30 years will be quite significant uh, and will be noticeable in terms of the financing of social security. And it's something which needs to be built in to your plan. You should never plan social security in the short term. You should plan Social Security with a long-term vision as to what it's going to cost as the whole system develops and works through and allowing for these demographic changes which are going to be upon us. And it's also going to have important implications for society because there will be a vast increase in the percentage of the population over the age of 65 and indeed over the age of 80 as well. Um, and you can see here that, um, that the Western Asian region, the, the Arab region just to the, uh, the east of here, uh, is going to be one of the highest um, counting regions for this percentage increase in the numbers over the age of 65 uh, anywhere in the world. So there will be this big growth in the older part of the population uh, which will have important implications for many aspects of society. Well, what does this uh, imply in terms of what it forces us to do for social security systems? Um, some social security systems would like to just sit tight and let it happen and see what uh, the implications are. But all around the world, it seems that there is a, a realization that the earlier you start to think about these issues, uh, the better it is and the more room for maneuver you create politically and practically and administratively uh, to address the problem. If you just let it run and don't address the issue, then it becomes much more difficult uh, as time goes on. 
And third countries have been looking at the contribution rates, looking at the benefits, looking at the whole structure of social security and whether that can be modified into a more effective structure, looking at retirement age and when people take retirement, looking at new approaches to financing, and looking also at the development of funding pension systems, uh, either as part of social security or to sit alongside uh, national social security systems. For benefits, uh, one of the challenges facing many countries is to bring the benefit promises down to a more affordable level. And that means looking at things like the accrual rate, at the um, amount of at the averaging period, how much of people's career you take into account in determining the benefit, and at the qualifying period, how long you have to work and contribute uh, to Social Security for in order to obtain a uh, full benefit. There's also a, a desire and interest in trying to relate the benefits more closely to what people pay. And, and that, in a way, is a, quite an important change in thinking about Social Security because many Social Security systems have been developed on the basis of a solidarity approach where the, the benefits are determined in terms of what is sensible and needed by the beneficiaries and the contributions are what are needed to finance those benefits in terms of social uh, protection and transfers from working population and the government and employers towards the, the beneficiaries. But the change of thinking is in, that in many countries, uh, incentives are much better improved if you have a closer relationship between what people pay in and what they get out. And people are then more incentivized to contribute because they can see the relationship better. And that has some advantages, but it also has some disadvantages, uh, as we'll see uh, later when we look at some of these systems. Also, countries have been looking at their indexation levels. I think that's less of an issue in this area because most of the uh, schemes, social security schemes in the region don't have generous indexation provisions. But a key issue for this area is the issue of coverage and the, the need to think in terms of reforming social security systems to extend and expand coverage uh, to a wider set of the population. But if we think of some of the more radical things that can be done to social security systems, uh, one of them is a move to something more like a defined contribution system. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that uh, in a moment. But there are also tendencies in some countries, and to some extent this has been encouraged and pushed by the, the World Bank, uh, to move the social security system towards being more of a safety net rather than attempting to provide for all retirement income and to shift the responsibility of providing higher levels of retirement income towards uh, the individual and employers and uh, the privately funded pension system. And this would imply having social security schemes which have a greater emphasis on flat rate benefits, which provide a safety net to the whole population, rather than attempting to replicate uh, income during the working life uh, into the retirement period. Another way of doing that, uh, which a few countries have gone for, is to introduce more of a targeted approach, a means tested approach, which tries to target some of the social security income on those who need it most rather than simply those who have uh, contributed a lot or have been in the system for longest. Other factors which countries are experimenting with are the pre-funding of Social Security uh, in order to use investment returns to help to reduce long-term costs and to flatten out the contributions over a longer period instead of having this constant upward surging of contributions over the next 30 years. And of course, uh, a common theme in, in many countries has been how to increase the role of privately funded uh, pension systems and how to make better use of investment markets and individual responsibility uh, in this respect. Let's come back to this idea of notional defined contribution. What does that uh, entail? Uh, I 
see the, the main rationale for this to create a direct link between the contributions paid and the benefits to which people become entitled. And effectively, the benefits are just defined as the accumulation of the con contributions which people have paid in. And that's a typical concept in the savings market, but these social security schemes are not savings schemes in the traditional sense because the money is not necessarily put away and invested, it is simply a way of defining what the individual's entitlement is. And the indexation process is usually based not on investment returns, but on uh, inflation or earnings growth or the increase in the economy, uh, increase in GDP or some other indicator which revalues people's contributions to current levels when they reach retirement. But another factor in using this approach is that you can then simulate people's thinking about saving, putting money aside, having a pot of money accumulated on their behalf, which when they reach retirement can be used to be converted into the form of income. It's converted by dividing the accumulated sum by an annuity factor, uh, which it then determines the pension to be paid. And another advantage from the point of view of the uh, administrators of such a scheme is that the annuity factor can reflect the latest estimates of expectation of life. And so it effectively passes on more to the participants the impact of improving uh, longevity rather than carrying that as one of the major risks of the system which has to be passed on to the next generation. It also permits a more flexible approach to retirement age since you can carry out this process of accumulating people's contributions to whatever age they decide to take retirement and convert it into income. It doesn't presuppose a particular age necessarily at which that transformation will take place. But where do we see examples of this? Well, the oldest example of this type of system uh, is in fact in France. It was not quite uh, formulated in this way, but the regime complementaire in France are essentially this type of system where you accumulate points which then have a value when you reach retirement age and can uh, convert that into uh, retirement income. But more recently, this has been the basis of pension reform in Sweden, Italy, Poland, some other Eastern European countries like uh, Latvia, uh, Brazil, and also most recently it's uh, forming the uh, basis of part of the new system in China. Well, what about new approaches to financing? Now, traditionally, Social Security in many countries was financed primarily by the employers and the employees together. It was the social partners working together to provide the cost of Social Security. In a few countries, the government also made a contribution. In some countries in the uh, Arab world, the government contribution is quite significant, uh, but not in all. But uh, in a number of countries looking at reform of their system and affordability in the long term, uh, have begun to look at increasing the share which government finances out of general revenue, because that enables some of the costs to be uh, met by non-labor-related taxation. The employer and employee contributions to Social Security are perceived as labor taxes. They are a tax on employment uh, and on the activities of the labor market. And if you increase those taxes or equivalents of taxes uh, by too much, you will disincentivize people to employ people uh, or to work. And so it can be advantageous economically to shift the burden of cost to a wider range of possible revenue raising activities. Uh, another possibility is to pre-fund part of the liability, and that's already happening in many of the uh, Gulf uh, countries in this region where the uh, pension system has collected contributions far in excess of that needed to pay the benefits on a pay-as-you-go basis, and as a result has built up substantial funds which should enable the contribution rates to be maintained level over a longish period. Some countries are specifically trying to do that for the next 20-30 years 
as the demographic aging process goes through, it will enable them to keep their contribution levels uh, more constant. But this raises important challenges on the investment side, which need to be addressed in terms of keeping the investment process uh, independent of um, political influence to a greater extent, so that it ensures optimization of the investment returns for the benefit of the uh, beneficiaries and the people who are financing uh, the pension system, uh, and rather than simply uh, providing an additional source of finance for the government. Now, of course, that's a political issue, but I think a number of countries are trying to find ways in which this investment process can be made as uh, independent and as transparent as possible uh, in the interests of good governments and in the interests of it most effectively uh, intervening in the uh, investment markets. Uh, Chairman mentioned at the beginning some of the challenges here because investment markets may not be sufficiently developed to absorb these huge amounts of money which could potentially be involved. Um, and so there are challenges for the development of the capital markets and the development of suitable instruments of finance and also for the making use of opportunities of globalization to invest internationally uh, to make optimum use of these quite substantial social security investment funds. Well, one of the other areas of uh, development which we see around the world is a greater emphasis on the development of private funded schemes and that means occupational pension schemes run by employers as well as uh, individual account um, personal pensions which will be run by financial institutions uh, and to which individual members of the population can make contributions. Now there are almost as many different systems of doing this as there are countries in the world. There are many different approaches and uh, I'm not going to go into this area in any detail now, but it is an important area of potential development uh, which most countries see as something which will not necessarily replace the traditional social security systems, but will help to buttress them and support them by providing an additional pillar of social security so that the system becomes more multi-pillar, partly run through a national social security system, partly run through uh, occupational pensions, partly through private pension arrangements. It makes it more diverse and perhaps attempts to spread the risk of the system uh, over a greater number of alternative mechanisms. Now, the components of this type of system are very enthusiastic about how this will increase the level of investment in the market, which will have economic benefits for economic development and uh, the sustaining of the growth of capital markets. And it also introduces some uh, greater market disciplines into the pension process, which are perceived as being absent from uh, publicly run social security systems. And it's argued that this may improve the efficiency of delivery of social security and it also takes some of the political heat out of it because it diversifies the number of players in the social security field uh, and takes a lot of the heat away from the government and the public social security system uh, from being the, the only player and, and the principal uh, protagonist in this field. Well, perhaps the most famous and radical of such shifts to privatizing Social Security took place in Chile just over 20 years ago, uh, where they dismantled the defined benefit Social Security system entirely and uh, required all members of the working population to contribute to a pension fund of their choice. They call them AFPs. Uh, and there uh, are a number of them, there are fewer now than there were at one time, there have been up to about 25, now it's down to about a dozen such pension funds. Uh, and the contributions that people pay are fully invested in markets and they do, uh, give a return to the individual which is measured by the market returns so that when the individual reaches retirement,
retirement age, they have an accumulated sum which can then be used either to buy an annuity or to be drawn down uh, year by year in order to meet their retirement needs uh, within a band of uh, allowable um, drawing down levels. And the, the state still provides a minimum pension guarantee for people who are uh, working and contributing for a long enough period. So there is still an underpin uh, provided by uh, a sort of state social security system, but it's really, really a sort of needs tested basis according to how much you contributed and obtained from the private pensions. Another defined contribution system uh, of a rather different sort you find in Singapore where for many years they've had a uh, provident fund to which everybody contributes and this relates the benefits directly to the contributions paid in because it is simply a savings mechanism to which interest is added year by year but it's run by a central government institution uh, and therefore is not privatised in the way that the Chile system is or diversified from an investment point of view uh, and the money can be used by the Central Provident Fund to invest in um, socially desirable investments as well as in the markets and it has been viewed as an instrument of uh, government economic policy not just as a means of providing returns to the members. Poland is an example of one of the new countries that have gone into the defined contribution uh, system relatively recently. They introduced a notion of defined contribution as the basic social security scheme to replace their old defined benefit arrangement. And they have introduced a compulsory uh, funded element using um, the defined contribution approach and a number of funds into which the individuals can contribute. Russia is also trying to introduce such a funded second pillar, but the idea in Russia is that the, the money will all be collected by the Social Security Organization, by the Pension Fund of Russia, and then they will diversify the investment process by handing out investment mandates to different uh, fund managing organizations so that the administration is still centralized but the fund management becomes decentralized and eventually individuals will be able to choose how their funds are invested which fund manager uh, will be able to will have responsibility for investing their money and what sort of uh, investment profile that will have Turkey is a country in the region which has recently introduced the defined contribution element to Social Security as a supplement to the traditional Social Security mechanisms. And uh, this is uh, so far a voluntary basis rather than a mandatory basis and is designed to increase the level of funding in the system and to make people less reliant on the basic Social Security scheme. Well, one of the advantages of going down this route, the advantages are potentially that it will increase the level of savings in the economy and that it will help to develop local capital markets if funds are invested locally and not simply allowed to uh, trickle abroad to other countries. Therefore, it will help to provide investment capital for the development of the local economy. And it's also perceived that by taking some of the uh, heat of the social security system, which simply transfers money from those who are in work to those who are out of work, and manages some of this transfer through the market mechanisms, it will therefore help countries to address the aging problem uh, more straightforwardly. And also that investment returns will enable uh, a more effective long-term retirement income to be provided at lower cost. Now there are counter arguments to these because these are highly debated and discussed uh, areas in, amongst economists and social security experts and actuaries because none of these um, supposed advantages are entirely clear cut. Um, the idea that pensions will increase savings is not necessarily so if it simply substitutes for other mechanisms which people might have used to save money. 
uh, and the fact that they may be forced to put money into a pension scheme may make them less likely to save through other means, uh, unit trusts, uh, insurance, housing, uh, and variety of other possible investments. Many countries don't have the market mechanisms to absorb this amount of money, uh, and it's a big challenge in reforming pension systems to try to get the reform of the market and the development of the capital markets and the availability of investment opportunities to line up with the availability of funds coming from a rapidly growing pension system. And if you don't have sufficient opportunities and uh, places where money is needed for investment, the effect of simply increasing the supply of funds will be to push up prices rather than to, to create uh, investment. And the aging population will still have an impact. Um, Chairman mentioned at the beginning that maybe the baby boomer generation, the fact that money has been pouring into pension funds in the United States and in other countries as a result of the aging of the population, has been a contributing factor in the buoyancy of stock markets over the last uh, 20 years or so. And the fact that more and more of those people are coming to retirement age and wanting to withdraw their funds or put them into more conservative uh, investment vehicles as they get closer to retirement uh, may be a factor which is now causing uh, some of the pullback in the stock markets. And in fact, the stock markets are no longer uh, quite as exciting as they were a few years ago. Uh, and that could become even worse as we look 20, 30 years forward as the, the um, aging of the population uh, goes ahead. As more and more people have pensions which are dependent on markets, the uh, market impact of demographic change will become greater. Well, what about the whole concept of defined contribution plans? They're very popular at present and they have been implemented both in the funded sector and in the government sector with these notional schemes. And they have the very nice characteristic of being easier to implement than uh, many traditional defined benefit vehicles, uh, but they also have quite severe um, limitations in terms of individual members. Uh, because particularly the funded variety of defined contribution scheme passes the whole of the investment risk onto the individual. And although people have perhaps been lulled into thinking that investments will always generate uh, nice returns over the years, the fact that we have seen such huge fluctuations in markets over the last three or four years has brought home perhaps more forcibly than any theoretical discussion the fact that this is a very volatile area and if it's the individual's pension that is totally dependent on the value of the market and the interest rate level at which annuities can be financed, then it passes a very great level of investment risk onto the individual. And uh, I think that has to be appreciated and taken on board if we think of moving down the direction of defined contribution schemes. Now, in the notional defined contribution schemes, they don't have that same market exposure, but then that brings out the other aspect of defined contribution schemes, which is that the tight relationship between what you contribute and what you get out may be seen by some people as an advantage, but it can also be a significant disadvantage because many people don't have continuous employment throughout their life. Many people are out of the labor force. Many ladies, for example, take time out of the labor force to bring up families. Many people are out of the labor force because of unemployment or other factors. And the defined contribution system simply translates one's experience in working life into one's pension. It means that those who have good experience during their working life will also get good pensions. And uh, there is very little, if any, uh, cross-subsidy within the system. Although that's perceived as one of the advantages of defined contributions, it's also, from the public um, social cohesion and social protection angle, one of the major disadvantages of such systems. And if you go down the route of having private arrangements, then there are a whole number of issues to be addressed, which will be looked at, I think, 
later sessions in the conference, uh, David Lindemann, for example, will talk uh, tomorrow about regulation, the need for controls on uh, solvency and investments and guarantees and annuitization, a whole range of issues which need to be considered uh, as a private approach is pushed forward. Because private management introduces a number of new risks to the system uh, from potential insolvency or bad behavior by market players. Uh, it introduces substantial additional costs which don't exist in a public system such as marketing and other transaction costs. It introduces possibilities of people being sold the wrong thing and not having the risks explained to them adequately. And it introduces a much greater variability between what individuals can expect to get from the system as a result of different investment performance and the possible um, activities of individual players in the market. And it also introduces a whole new range of issues to be tackled in relation to annuities. Now annuities are important potential product of the insurance markets. So insurance companies can cope very well with the sharing of the longevity risk in the provision of annuities, but it is a very um, comprehensive and difficult area because it concentrates the risk of longevity within the insurance market rather than sharing it across the whole community. And although insurance companies are designed to do that, uh, the burden of running the whole pension system for a country uh, through annuitization with insurance companies uh, can become uh, and in some countries is already becoming quite uh, an important issue in terms of risk management, uh, given the potential of the population for improving uh, longevity. Well, if we look just back briefly at the challenges facing the different parts of the system, the public systems have got to work hard at increasing coverage and improving the incentive structure within their systems in order to adapt to modern labor markets to be ready for globalization, all those uh, impacts which are going to be on the economies of people uh, wanting to move more actively from one country to another, labor markets becoming more responsive to international demand. And above all, the public systems have got to avoid taking on and promising commitments which are unaffordable in the long term which means there needs to be a regular process of actuarial review and management of the system uh, to avoid uh, entering into unaffordable commitments. Improving administrative efficiency. I think perhaps uh, Mr. Festratton is going to tell us how this is managed or can be managed well within the social security system so as the, to turn away the criticism that public systems are not administered effectively and where there are funds to optimize the returns from those funds and to get the best out of the investment markets. For the private systems, the challenges are to set in place a, a good legislative structure which will uh, enable such systems to be properly controlled and done in a way which avoids uh, mishaps in the private pension market, encourages a sound regulatory approach which will not um, remove the incentive to run private funds but will enable them to be run in a way which will give confidence uh, to the members of those funds and to the uh, markets at large. To consider whether such private pension arrangements should simply be allowed to flower as voluntary arrangements or be made uh, mandatory as part of the compulsory system of social security uh, forcing people to invest at least part of their savings uh, in the pensions route. Is this something which should be just a responsibility of individuals, or can we find ways that involve employers better in the system so that they can share some of the risk and share some of the responsibility of managing the pension system? And then there are challenges to develop the investment markets and the annuity markets and to improve the contribution in many of the countries of the region of the actuarial profession, which as Ibrahim mentioned at the beginning, is very undeveloped in many parts of the Arab world. <coughs> My conclusions are that there is no single answer to these problems, not surprisingly since it is a very complex mix of problems, 
the funded pension systems are not simply a solution which can be put forward as a panacea for all ills, something which will solve all our problems. But we need to perhaps think in terms of developing an appropriate mix of these different systems, which will have properly address all of the issues which I've raised, and which will provide adequate coverage for the whole population uh, at a level of risk which is appropriate for individuals, employers and governments uh, for the future going forward. A well-regulated system, a system where the government cannot disengage uh, even with privatisation because there is still a high need for government regulation and supervision of the pension system in order to ensure that systems operate effectively and the costs are kept down and that the risks of mis-selling, mismanagement and misunderstanding are kept to a minimum. So I think that leaves us with a huge agenda for uh, potential change and development in social security in the coming years and great opportunities uh, for governments to introduce systems which will address these significant challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baker. I think uh, you gave us a comprehensive and as well detailed uh, rundown on the, on the issues that are facing us uh, with some suggestions and some conclusions. Uh, may I just point out to all of us who are in this room uh, the responsibilities that we have. Most of you are in charge of social security administrations and pension funds. And truly, uh, what our two speakers uh, are, are talking about are very deep challenges facing our societies, and they go to the core of how we want to ensure um, pensions, how we want to ensure benefits for our populations. And the choices are not easy, they have to be dynamic as well. Um, Mr. Feshap, and of course, is the president of the International Social Security Association. Um, he's going to be talking to us about social governance aspects of social security systems. And may I just mention that uh, increasingly governance issues are coming to the fore. Uh, all of you have lived through 2001 and 2002, and you've seen that issues of corporate governance have played an increasingly important role. We've seen some of the biggest corporations in the world who we thought were paradigms of good management and good corporate management turning out to be not having quite the right accounting, not quite having the right type of management. Indeed, they proved to be in many cases thieves. And the values of those corporations diminished in some cases in a few weeks by more than 17, 80%. So, the whole issue of governance uh, is not only, of course, only on the corporate or the private level, it also has to be applied at the uh, public level in terms of the governance of social security schemes. Um, and ensuring transparency, I think, to beneficiaries is something increasingly important. Um, making sure that the accounting systems that we have and the regulatory systems that we have um, provide the sort of accountability that people expect and that the officials who are in charge of those institutions also abide by very high standards. And increasingly, I think, the, the whole issue of the relationship between the public and private has to do with separating ownership and responsibility from government finance and taking it more to ownership and responsibility in terms of who are the final beneficiaries of such systems. 